The sitting is resumed. It is time for questions to the Minister for of Agriculture and Rural Development. I have to inform the House that questions 5, 11 and 13 have been withdrawn. And we'll start with listed questions. I call Mr Michael Majimsey. Uh, thank Majimsey. you, Deputy Speaker. Question number one. I have followed the recent reports about dog breeding. I am totally committed to protecting and safeguarding the welfare of all animals, including dogs and pups. My department made the dog breeding establishment regulations in 2013 to impose new licensing conditions to protect the welfare of all dogs and pups that are in breeding establishments. A person breeding dogs with, without a license or in breach of the license conditions can be fined up to £5,000 and imprisoned for up to six months. When it comes to dog breeding rules, we have the strictest controls across these islands. Councils are responsible for enforcing these controls and the legislation provides them with strong powers. Legislation alone will not stop illegal puppy farming. This will take a concerted effort by the public, dog buyers, welfare charities, enforcement agencies, all working together to identify breeders, licensed or unlicensed, who put financial gain before the welfare of their dogs and pups. All evidence <coughs> about, illegal, about illegal dog breeding should be reported to councils for a full investigation. Those responsible for animals, including dog breeders, must also comply with the Welfare of Animals Act 2011. I strongly believe that anyone found guilty of causing unnecessary suffering to any animal should face the tough penalties set out in the Act, which currently mean up to two years imprisonment and or an unlimited fine. The implementation of the Act is being reviewed at present and the interim report of the review is out for public consultation. A copy can be found on my department's website. As the dog breeding regulations are made under this Act, their implementation is also being reviewed. Given recent publicity, I want to provide additional time for people to provide their views on dog breeding, and I have therefore extended the consultation closing date until the 21st of May. Mr. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for her answer. Uh, the BBC Spotlight programme clearly illustrates that whatever legislative regime we have in place, it is imperfect. Uh, it is not properly working when you saw the level of greed, exploitation and downright cruelty. Can the Minister explain to the House what steps she is now going to take to put an immediate stop to this type of trade, to prevent it happening now, prevent it happening in the future and indeed to allow those dog breeders who rely solely on good practices uh, to continue without unjustified stigma? Yes, and you are absolutely right and that is important that, that, that we do that and I think, as I said in the original answer, um, the issue of puppy farming um, legislation alone won't, won't drive it out. I think we need that concerted effort across all the agencies. We have very strong legislation. It is when you compare it to um, other areas or other jurisdictions, you can see that we have very strong legislation in place. However, there's always room for improvement, which is why I set out last year after a debate in the House um, to, to actually set about reviewing that legislation. I've, on the back of the, the recent, I suppose, attention that the issue is getting, I've extended that consultation, and I am of the view. And I've published the report on the website that, that, that I am minded to look towards strengthening the legislation where necessary and making sure that um, the department has um, the strongest possible legislation that we can have in place. Obviously, the members are aware that um, councils enforce the, the action and we need to see robust enforcement on the ground. That's something that I do believe happens. However, the incidents which we witnessed last week were criminal or over the last number of weeks in the media where there's criminality involved, obviously there needs to be full PSNI investigation also. But I do believe that with a concerted effort we can strive to drive out that illegal activity but also um, create uh, a safe space for those people that are actually involved in good practice to be able to carry out their, their normal training. Mr Joe Byrne. Thank you, Mr Prince, Deputy Speaker. I thank the Minister for her comments and her answer so far. Would the Minister accept that not all of these dog breeding establishments are living up to the due standards and the requirements of the Animal Welfare Act, and what can be done to further reinforce obeyance and compliance in terms of the legislation and also in compliance with the remit of the district councils? Yes, I mean, as, as the member is aware, it is the, um, the responsibility of local councils to enforce the Dog Breeding Controls and the Welfare of Animals Act 2011 and also the dog breeding establishment regulations. So there are quite strong stringent controls there. Um, it is up to the councils to enforce it on the ground. And, and, and I know um, very much from engaging with councils that they would be more than happy, their enforcement officers would be more than happy to receive information from the public if there were um, any concerns out there in relation to um, any sort of um, underhand practices that, that could be occurring in the industry. I mean, puppy farming itself isn't, isn't illegal, but there needs to be very strong 
protocols in place and where people aren't adhering to those, then the council officers need to take very strong action. Up to Fragra. Uh, and the Minister has touched on this in her previous two answers, but could she tell us what legal standards and conditions apply here that dog breeders must adhere to? Yes, the, the 2013 regulations require that um, all commercial dog breeding establishments have to be licensed and they have to provide each council with, um, or the, the regulations provide each council with powers to inspect and grant licenses um, for establishments within their control. The dog breeding establishment um, conditions include providing suitable accommodation, welcome facilities and diet, microchip on all dogs within seven days of arriving on the premises if they're not already um, chipped, and pups before their eight um, weeks of age in the, that are in the establishment, the age at which the bitch can first be bred and the number of litters she can produce in her lifetime, the minimum age a pup can leave the breeder, maintaining records and having written socialisation and enrichment programme for approval by the council, and District Council may also apply additional conditions in the licence if they feel it's required. My department provided guidance on council enforcement officers to council enforcement officers um, on the licence conditions. And if the operator can't meet the standards of the legislation, a licence cannot be granted. And if a licence has been granted but the establishment no longer is complying with the standards, then the licence must be revoked. Well, Mr. Chris Little. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Can I uh, welcome the uh, extension of the review of the implementation of the Welfare of Animals Act by the Minister to include consideration of this very serious issue of uh, puffy, puppy farming? And can I ask the Minister, would, would she agree that uh, dogs are not a commodity? Um, they should be bought from licensed breeders, and that if there are recommendations from the review of the uh, animal welfare legislation here in Northern Ireland in terms of reform, that she will action those without delay? I can absolutely give that assurance, which is why we um, embarked after the, the debate which the member contributed to um, last year, um, why we embarked on the review process. There are a number of recommendations that have already been made, but I do think in light of um, recent developments and the, the attention that this issue has been given, I think that there may be scope for to take a look at actually strengthening up the legislation, and I'm certainly committed to doing that, and that's why I'm carrying out the review. Um, the other issue, I think that there are like, potential changes that we could bring forward. Um, like for example, in the interim report, one of the suggestions is around um, the penalties, that they could be increased to 12 months um, imprisonment on summary conviction and five years imprisonment and an unlimited fine on conviction on indictment. So um, I think that there, are, there is scope there to make sure that we do everything we can to make it act, to, to create a deterrent, if you like, for, for this illegal practice. And I suppose the message to the public is just be careful about where you're buying your pups, where you're buying your dogs. I think that... Um, you, you want to be using reputable people, you want to be making sure people have licences and they're actually um, looking after the animals that, that, that you're buying. And if you're in any doubt, um, I encourage people to contact their council enforcement officers to investigate if they're in any way um, unsure of someone's practices. Mr. Jim Allister. The Minister refers to us having very strong legislation. Since the 2011 Act came in and the 2013 regulations came into effect, how many prosecutions have there been? and how many licenses have been revoked? I don't have the figures on the licenses being revoked, but actually in relation just to dog breeding establishments, establishments there's been one conviction, but under the Welfare of Animals Act in, in 2011, there's been, you'll be aware, over the last um, number of months, there's been some very high profile and very um, stringent sentences handed down by the courts, which is something obviously that we welcome. So I think that in itself shows an effectiveness. But as I've said, whilst I do believe that we have very strong legislation, there's always room for improvement, which is the, the process that I'm now embarked upon. Pat Ramsey is not in this place. I call Miss Anna Lowe. Question number three, please. The executive decision to create a new Department of Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs is one which I fully endorse. There will be considerable work to do to ensure that the new department is fully operational following the Assembly elections in May 2016. My department already engages with environmental and non-government organisations on a wide range of issues and I recognise the positive role that the NGOs play in respect of policy and delivery across our existing responsibilities. There is engagement on agri-environment schemes, water quality, the greenhouse gas implementation partnership, development of the agriculture land use strategy and fisheries issues to name just a few um, examples. I believe that we have a constructive relationship in respect um, of agriculture and the environment and I look forward to continuing to develop and to build on that relationship. These were early days in relation to the creation of the new department and a small team is being set, is being set up to begin to map out what needs to be done. 
However, going forward, I see the continued engagement with the environmental NGOs is important. I welcome their support as we jointly work to achieve positive environmental outcomes. My permanent secretary will be meeting with um, representatives from the NGOs in the coming weeks, and they will be discussing the implications of the departmental restructuring and the role of the NGOs in delivery of environmental functions under the, new, uh, the remit of the new department. Ms. Lowe, first supplement. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Principal Deputy Speaker. I, I thank the Minister for her response, and I certainly welcome her, her proactive approach to now uh, you know, looking at, at the, the two departments working oh. together. And, and I'm sure you agree with me the, the important role of the, uh, the environment sector. Would she give a commitment that before the finalising of any details with this group you're talking about uh, you know, between the two departments, uh, before the finalising of any details that uh, there will be engagement or public consultation on how the environment function the is going to, to move forward? Yes, I can give a member that assurance. As I said, um, we'll begin that process of engagement with them. Um, we want to continue that strong working relationship that we have. I don't see any reason as to why that would change in the future. But I think that as we shape the new department, I think it's, keen, it's very key that we use the expertise that's there within the NGO sector and make sure that um, they feel part of the process. Because obviously, both ourselves in, in government, but also NGOs, have a key role to play in making sure that we provide what we should be providing on the ground. So, yes, I can give that assurance. Mr. Barry McElduff. Thank you, Principal uh, Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister what existing environmental functions will transfer to the new department following on from restructure? Yes, the environmental aspects of, of DUE are currently contained within its Environment and Marine Group, so the group covers an extensive range of policies and functions. The following functions will transfer to the, to the new department, and that's going to be environmental protection, drinking water land and resource management, industrial pollution and radiochemical, marine and then other policy areas including climate change, air quality, water quality, habitats directive, environmental noise, invasive species and the carrier bag levy. Mr. John Duff. Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, I thank the Minister for her answers. The Minister will agree with me, of course, that the environment is the most important, critical aspect of life for ourselves and for future generations. Can the Minister give us some indication of what the relationship will be with the Environment Agency and will it have the independence and the teeth to go after those who pollute our land and our waterways? Yes, well that obviously would be the intention, but I think that, um, we, when we're shaping this new department it's, it's very important that we get the balance right because I think there's always a bit of concern around different policy perspectives from DARD and DOE point of view, so that there's a challenge there between the environmental issues and then what farmers do on the ground. I personally believe that the two areas of work will, work, will complement each other. They'll work very well. I think that um, we have to use the time ahead to um, make sure that we iron out any of the challenges that are there, but certainly um, my intention and if DOE uh, Environment Agency was within the department, you'd want to make sure that that, that, that um, agency is fit for purpose that they are able to chase those people that are um, flaunting the law and are breaking the rules in terms of damaging the environment. So um, I think that uh, there will be tremendous benefits, I think, for actually um, bringing all these things together under the one umbrella of the new department. Sir Robin Swan. Thank you very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. The Minister will be aware of a perception among farmers as well that the NIEA do over-regulate and over-inspect and over-persecute them in relation to other industries. If NIEA can and as part of the Department of Agriculture, will she work to make sure that there's a realisation that the inspection agency actually understands the industry they are inspecting? Yes, absolutely. And I do, I do think that there will be um, potential. The member will be aware that I've said previously that we're looking at the actual whole inspection regime and how we can actually tidy that up, create less inspections, maybe doing a number of um, activities in the one visit. So I do think that there is potential to, to make sure we do that. All inspectors are well trained. Their job is not to go out to make life difficult, but sometimes that can be the perception from the farming industry. So I suppose it's about how can we work with the industry to help them to be able to, to flourish, but also protecting the environment. So I do think that all um, this area of work coming under the one umbrella will, will lead to benefits in, in the long term for the farming community, but also for the environment. Mr Chris Hazard. Let's call you Kesha Hull, question number four. 
The European Maritime and Fisheries Fund is the successor to the European Fisheries Fund and officials are currently working with colleagues in the Marine Management Organisation and with DEFRA to ensure timely implementation of this scheme to support the fishing and the aquaculture industries. The key to the implementation of the new funding programme is the approval of the operational programme which describes how the money allocated by Europe will be spent. This document is currently being drafted by DEFRA with input from other fisheries administrations and is expected to be formally submitted to the European Commission by the end of April, or by the end, over the next number of weeks, it was due to be by the end of April. The Commission then has six months um, to work with DEFRA to ensure that the um, plan is approved by October 2015 and then at that stage the Department can consider opening the programme to applications for funding. In parallel to that work, the Department are working closely with um, the, within the, the Marine Management Organisation to deliver the operational processes that are required to administer the programme. This will involve the development of a new IT system to underpin the administrative process and that new IT system will also allow applicants to make their claims online and I'm confident that this will um, ensure an easier application process. I anticipate all of this work to be finalised on schedule and EMFF will be open for applications in autumn 2015. In the meantime, my officials will provide updates including form and guidance via the DARD website and this should be available early in the summer. Hazard for supplement. I want to thank the Minister for an answer. I'm sure the local uh, fishing fleet uh, will be glad to know that you know, the system will be certainly easier. Something else that is bothering the local fishing fleet, of course, at the minute was the incident with the uh, submarine uh, in the RIC uh, only a matter of days ago. Uh, I, I want to thank the Minister for activity uh, in regard to this, coming down to our glass and to meeting with the, the trawler involved. Um, can I just ask for perhaps an update on what the Minister has been able to do? Yes. The I thank the, the member for inviting me to go down and meet with fishermen. And, um, it was very clear and it's very evident that the fishermen are concerned. Um, they're concerned every day that they go out, uh, given the fact that they don't know what has actually happened. Um, I have spoken to, um, I've raised the issue with the Ministry of Defence, but they need to be transparent because fishermen, as they go out every day, they're taking their life in their hands because they don't know if they're going to encounter a similar instance again. So we need answers on this. We need, fishermen need to know what, um, was it a submarine? What was it doing on their fishing grounds? Um, I spoke to Theresa Villers, the Secretary of State. She assures me that it wasn't um, that they, they, they are not aware of any um, Navy submarines being in the area or within any sort of distance close to the area at the time. So that begs the question then, who was in the area? So there are a number of questions that, that need to be answered because this incident very clearly posed a threat to the life of the four people that were on, on, on board the ship uh, at, that, at that time. And it, the risk of it happening again remains, and these people are concerned for their livelihood, their families are concerned um, for, for their lives um, every day when they go out until they receive the answers. So I certainly will be pushing the Ministry of Defence, the Secretary of State, the Department of Transport and um, the Marine Accident Investigation Branch to get answers for, for the fishing industry who, um, as the member has said, rightly deserve the answers. Mr Sean Roger. Thank you Mr Deputy Speaker. And th can I thank the Minister for her answer answers thus far? And in terms of uh, welcome the, the further funding for Europe in terms of developing our agri-food economy, can I ask you, Minister, what grant aid support from Europe will DAR be applying to to assist the fishing ports of Port of Ogie, Artlas, and Kilkeel? I'm thinking specifically of something there like the Kilkeel Vision for Vision 220 for the new port. Thank you. Yeah, well, the member will know that the, the main aim of the EMFF is, is to support the delivery of um, the reform common fisheries policy within member states and for us that will include the current issues around um, the landing obligations and the need to minimise levels of bycatches um, for the fleet. So therefore EMFF in the first instance will all, um, obviously help with gear trials um, on research on reducing um, bycatches, developing the infrastructure for the handling of the bycatch um, and adapting fishing gears for, for fishing vessels. And similar to the um, EFF, EMFF will provide support to the local fishing industry in terms of the ports infrastructure, so dealing with the issues that you, you've set out. It'll um, support them in terms of promoting safer fisheries, um, processes and aquaculture operatives, community-led local development. So the department is working with the fish industry around developing those um, detailed proposals and then we plan to work with the fishing communities over the summer to get them into a state of readiness so that when they program opens in the autumn that they're ready to bid in. So I think um, it's something obviously the fish industry are waiting for the new program to open and I'm keen to work with them to make sure that everybody knows how to avail of the funding, what's eligible under the funding and, and we'll certainly be doing that work over the summer. Ms Bronwyn McGarkin. Gurmi, I'll get to question six. 
I was pleased to announce the opening of my department's new rural micro capital grant scheme um, program earlier this month. This program will contribute to reducing poverty and social isolation within rural communities through the provision of a micro capital grant to eligible rural community organisations. Financial support of up to £1,500 each is available for selected projects, and this is intended to encourage rural community and voluntary groups to improve and develop their facilities and assets, which in turn will contribute to improve community engagement within the local area. The programme is designed to be very accessible for applicants and administratively straightforward for delivery. Projects selected for funding must fit within the overall objective of the programme and align to the themes of modernisation of existing premises or assets, ICT or health and wellbeing. These have proven to be particularly effective themes in tackling poverty and social isolation and are relevant to all of those living in rural communities from the very young to the elderly. The programme aims to engage a geographically broad range of rural groups, including those hard to reach rural organisations in remote areas. For this reason, the Rural Support Networks, currently delivering the Rural Community Development Support Service, will promote and deliver the microgrants programme on a sub regional basis to ensure as wide a reach and impact as possible. I anticipate that over 150 rural community organisations will directly benefit from the initial £200,000 that's been set aside in my Tackle Rural Poverty and Social Isolation budget for this new scheme. If there is sufficient demand, this allocation could be extended. The new programme represents an excellent opportunity for community groups to build on their existing roles in strengthening community engagement and improving the lives of those living in rural areas. first supplement. Uh, I, I thank the Minister for her response. Can the Minister outline the specific details of the scheme, such as grant rates, match funding and project duration? The Rural um, Grant Programme can provide grant aid to uh, somewhere or anywhere in the range of between a minimum of £200 up to a maximum of £1,500 to eligible rural community-led voluntary organisations. Capital grants will be provided at a rate of up to 85% of the total project cost, up to a maximum grant of £1,500. Applicants are expected to provide a minimum of 15% match funding towards their project in the form of a cash contribution. Applicants must incur the initial cost of their approved purchases and then claim the grant back once their project is completed. No advance payments will be provided. In order to ensure that as many groups as possible get the opportunity to benefit from the programme, groups will um, be only allowed one award each. Applicants must be... Um, able to complete the projects and claim the grant within four months from the date of their award. <coughs> Ms. Karen McEvan. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, can I ask the Minister how does DARD propose um, to promote and deliver the programme to promote um, the smaller rural businesses? There will certainly be opportunities under the new rural development programme and once we have that cleared from Europe and we're hopeful to get a letter of comfort at least to get things moving, um, you'll be aware that the lags have now been set up and they're actually working on their strategic plans for their individual areas. Um, certainly under the, under the, the programme, there is an element of, of um, one of the measures is directly support, to support rural business, but then also under tourism and all, all the other measures, there's also quite a, a scope. Um, in terms of the details of, of the specific um, measure, it's available on the DARD website if the member wants to get more details, but there is a, a tailored measure to support rural businesses. I think that um, this project the rural development program served rural business well and created a um, considerable number of jobs in its current um, program and we look forward to doing um, even more of that in, in this program once we get it um, up and running on, on the ground and I hope to have spend uh, and start to actually d deliver funding into areas you know certainly um, shortly after we open the program um, over the summer months. Well, Mr Robin Swap. Thank you very much, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. Uh, the Minister will know of matter in the past in regards to credit unions in the rural community. Will this micro grant scheme be open to credit unions? As I know in the past, there were difficulties with the rural development program gain, with credit unions gaining access. Yes, there were some difficulties. I'll have to write to the member just to clarify if um, they will be eligible. I think that um, because of it was a financial service, there were, there were some um, issues um, with, within European rules, but. Um, depending on the, on, the, on the setting of the credit union and how it's run, and there, there may be opportunities, but I'll clarify that for the member in ring. Mr. Mutri is not in his place. I call Mr. Patsy McGlover. Question number eight, please. The draft rural development programme was formally submitted to the European Commission on the 14th of October last year. The Commission observation letter on the draft programme was received on the 31st of March of this year. So we look forward to being able to start the formal adoption process with the aim of having our programme approved as soon as possible and ideally before the summer. However, given the delay in receiving the Commission's observation letter, in the worst case scenario, we would expect to um, obtain 
programme approval by September 2015, but we're working to continue uh, working with the Commission on the necessary business cases and sorry, we're working within the department to make sure that we have the necessary business cases in place and the design, um, the proposed schemes, that, so that they're ready to go in a state of readiness as soon as we have the, the green light from, from Europe. Um, the 26 countries actually just in the last number of days have received a letter of comfort from Europe and we expect to re receive something similar um, which would allow us to sort of get, get the work going and get, get the spend on the ground as soon as possible but ideally we're, our intention is to have it um, on the ground before the summer. Mr McLean for a supplementary. Gurr Magad, Frio Cian Colia. Thanks very much, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. Uh, could I ask the Minister to give some uh, detail to the House, please, as to the delay and what has caused that delay and what measures have been put in place to make sure that things are eventually speeded up? The, well, the delay is, is that we're waiting for Europe to give us uh, the green light to go ahead. Um, I think that possibly the Commission underestimated the the amount of work in clearing and approving all the operating plans from all the member states. So we are um, awaiting that, that green light to be able to go, but we're not, um, in the absence of having that, we're, we're, as I said, we're developing the business plans, we're getting the, the, the projects in the ground, we've established our lags, we've allocated the funding, or we've, we've given um, indication of the allocation of funding for each lag. So we're, we're in a state of readiness, we're, we're good to go as soon as we get the, the the Commission approval. Like, so far, the Commission have only approved 27 out of the 118 applications that they, or operating plans that they have with them. So um, we expect that they're going to clear somewhere in the region of 30 to 40 over um, this month. And, and obviously, we're pushing um, to try and have our plan approved before June. But in the absence of having the full clearance, if we even um, can achieve the ladder of comfort, then we're able to open the programme. And, and as I said, we're ready to open that as soon as we have that green light. Mr. William Irwin. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, given the large number of observations from the, com the Commission, uh, I think somewhere over 300, um, is it not inevitable that the, it's going to take longer to get this approved? Well, there are quite a number of um, observations, and quite a lot of them we can accept, and I think we can move very quickly to address. And we have been, over the last number of weeks since we received the letter, we have actually, um, officials have had a number of teleconferences with Europe, and we're working our way through them. So I think that. Um, as I said, if you look at how many out of 118 um, papers that have came to the Commission, they've only been able to clear a small number of them. However, they have uh, um, said that they are really working on that backlog and they intend to try and turn a number of these around very quickly. There was a number of issues um, raised from the Commission in relation to the environment and climate change objectives and they wanted a bit more detail on some issues. Um, there were a lot of things were minor than we'd be able to address. So, my intention is just we'll just keep the pressure on Europe, we'll just keep pushing to get the, the green light to be able to open the programmes as soon as possible. Mr Declan McAleer. Uh, uh, could the Minister el elaborate a little bit more on some of the, the key issues that were raised in the observation letter? Yeah, the, the Commission the, the raised 315 observations, but a lot of them, the majority of them, are just minor and technical in nature. However, there are a number of key issues to be addressed. Um, particularly in relation to regards of ANC, the Commission had requested that the method used for, cal for the calculation of income foregone and additional costs for the exclusion of disadvantaged area be detailed. They've asked in relation to the programme's environment and climate change objectives, they wanted a bit more detail on the agri-environment climate measures. Um, again, wanted a bit more detail. There were some issues around some of the cross-cutting things of the programme. Um, one of the other issues actually, and I've given a commitment to the sector that I will take a look at, that, at this, is the fact that we didn't include an option for um, support for the organic um, farming sector. Uh, and I've actually given a commitment um, that I will, to, the, to, to the organic farming sector that I will actually take a look at that and see if we can. It wasn't something that was raised in the consultation as, as being identified as something that there's a major demand for. However, for those number of farmers that are um, in organic farming, they believe that um, they're entitled to support and, and I give a commitment that I will look positively at, at that if, if it can stack up in a business case. That ends the period for listed questions. Um, we'll now move to topical questions. Mr Pat Ramsey is not in his place. I call Mr Sean Rogers. Thank you Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. Minister, the good weather has contributed to a great lambing season. The farmers have great, great crops of lambs. But just as they're about to bring them to market, 
Uh, there are labelling issues with the, with the Republic, and they're taking a significant reduction in the price, the price of their lamb. What is the Department doing to address this labelling issue? I mean, the member's right. Historically, a significant number of our lambs have been um, going to the 26 counties for slaughter and then further export into like, premium markets across Europe. And recently, there's been this issue where um, some processors were actually refusing to take lambs in some instances, and others were taking them, but um, farmers were having to take a reduction in, in the money that they were being offered. So um, I'm very concerned about this. This is an issue which I have raised consistently because it's based around the country of origin labelling. And I've raised it consistently with um, Simon Coveney. I've actually um, chatted with them last night and I will speak to them again today. We've tasked officials um, with actually looking at can we produce a voluntary label and I've approached Europe and they have an open mind to us being able to produce a voluntary label which would serve the industry well across the island and then take away any um, trade barriers that there would be as a result of um, country of origin labelling. The member will be aware that um, the European legislation now says that you have to state um, where the animal was born, reared and slaughtered. So if it was born in the six counties and slaughtered in the 26, it can't be sold um, as Irish lamb into um, other European markets. So I'm extremely concerned, just given the time of year that it is, and this is where farmers go to market. So I can assure you that both at a European level, working with um, DEFRA and Simon Coveney, that we are trying to find a solution through this voluntary label process. Mr. Rogers, for some... Minister, could I thank you for your answer? Because lambs reared in the Mourns or lambs reared in, in, in Carlingford are, are, just the, are just the same lamb. Could you possibly put any timeline on, on, your, on the negotiations and discussions? Because it's, it's very, very important to farmers at the minute that they get a reasonable price for their lambs. I mean, all I can say is that I know it's an immediate problem and we're working, um, we are working very closely. And as I said, I raised the issue with Simon Coveney again last night and I, and I will talk to him. I'm expecting a phone call from him again today. We've both tasked our, our permanent secretaries. This is a high priority issue it needs to be dealt with. So they have been working on it for, for some time in advance of the European rules coming into play. But all I can say is that I'm aware it's an immediate issue and we are trying to find a solution. Ms. Michaela Boyd. Gormogut and Nash Kemkolia. Can I ask the Minister, uh, given her recent visit to Straban, uh, can she give me an update on the DAR Direct Office within Straban? Gormogut. Yes, I can um, just say that the things are going ahead smoothly. We're um, on target. Um, as, as I said that time when we came up actually as a positive news story that um, we were creating 30 plus jobs in the Dart Direct Office. So things are going well and I think that um, we can look forward to having that new uh, office opened um, on schedule for next year. The beauty of that office is the fact that it's a number of services coming together. So I think that in itself um, has, has been very useful and it was a very good use of public money given that a number of departments were going to locate there together. For supplement. Can I thank the Minister for her response and obviously she would be aware that this is a good news story for Straban. Is the Minister confident that the planned works will go ahead and the time frame for the opening of the Dar Direct will be next year? Gormogut? Yes, I, can, I can give an assurance that that's the time frame we're working to and we've, we've no um, reason at this stage to believe that there'll be any delay in that. It's full steam ahead for the project, the, the work's on the ground and, and we hope to have our staff all moved into their new premises next year. Mr Phil Flanagan. Can I ask the, the Minister to provide the House with an update um, as to what progress has been made on increasing um, trade exports and improving access to new markets for um, our agri-food sector? Yes, um, we've, we've made um, quite a lot of progress, but particularly in relation to pork. I'm very pleased that last week we had the inspection of one of our um, processors by Chinese officials responsible for approving the North and for approving Britain to export, to export even trotters, and that all went well. I'm also delighted that at this moment in time we currently have Chinese inspectors um, also here for the next couple of days. Um, inspecting our processors to again open that up that export market so um, we're delighted to have to have that progress we've been waiting for these Chinese um, um, inspectors to visit for, for quite a number of months so it's great that they're here I also intend to um, follow that visit up at the end of the month I'll um, go into seek a number of political meetings in China so we'll spend um, four or five days there and hopefully we'll be able to get positive news in terms of um, opening up that market for pork uh, and I'm very, very confident that um, that will be the case, that we have first-class product, we have first-class processors with really high standards, and I have no doubt that um, the Chinese inspectors that are here at the minute will be equally as impressed as um, 
the delegation that was here last week. Jeff Lanigan for supplement. The free asking drug is going to be a slash in RS up to Aragri. Um, I, I couldn't agree more with the Minister about the, the standard of our pork products, particularly if you take um, some of the things like Pater Doherty's black bacon and Enniskillen. Um, but given the threat of a, a European exit and the commitment of, of some parties here um, to push for a, a referendum on um, leaving Europe, can I ask the Minister to outline how important she feels EU membership is um, for this part of Ireland in terms of trade um, and other opportunities for the agri food sector? Yeah, well, I mean, obviously, membership of the EU opens up um, opportunities and, and doors for our exporters, and it affords um, farmers and, and processors alike significant advantage to trade with all the other 27 member states. But even if you take it in a, in a purely local context and the, the contribution to the local economy, to the farming industry, like in 2014, £248 million pounds of single farm payment, £23.6 million was um, distributed through the less favoured areas compensatory scheme. 20 million was invested through the agri-environment scheme. So our agricultural communities, our rural communities are so dependent on that subsidy that comes from Europe. And I believe that um, being part of the, the EU allows our industry to achieve the, the, the most value from their worldwide um, export <coughs> market. So I think that when, when you look at the benefits that are to be achieved, it really does um, sort of call into question why some parties would consider that pulling out of the EU is something that would um, be beneficial for the local farming industry because I dare say if you ask any farmer or any person who lives in a rural community or rural business who has benefited from the rural development programme, they certainly can tell you the benefits because they feel it. They feel it in their um, income every week and I think that um, it's just madness. It's, it's madness for, for anybody to consider that um, pulling out of the EU would benefit our local industry because it clearly would not. Question number five has been withdrawn within the appropriate time. Question number six, Mr David McNary is not in his place. Question number seven has been withdrawn within the appropriate time. I call Ms Anna Lowe. Thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. I'm glad I had the question in mind. I <laughs> uh, just want to ask the Minister, what are the course assumptions now for the relocation uh, of, of your headquarters to Bali Kelly? Uh, Bali, uh, Bali Kelly. Bali Kelly. Um, and would it not be better for that money, uh, you know, put aside for for public uh, frontline services? No. <laughs> I, the, the benefits of relocation. I mean, the executive has a commitment to relocate public sector jobs. There is an unfairness, a real imbalance, and an inequity in the distribution of public sector jobs. So this move is going to be the first department to move lock, stock and barrel into the rural area, and it's right and proper that should be the case. People who live in rural areas are entitled to have the same opportunities in public services as those that live in more urban settings. So for me, the, the benefits for the North West are tremendous. The economic benefits, the, the construction of the building, the ongoing servicing of the building, the fact that people can get a, and the public service can get a better work-life balance. So for me, um, it, it's full steam ahead for the project. Um, th there is an executive commitment. We need to see more departments doing this. We do need to provide an equity in terms of the access to public sector jobs. So full steam ahead. Slow for supplementary. Thank you. Very clear answer from the Minister. Um, given my earlier question about the new department uh, taking in uh, agriculture and the environment, so what's going to happen to DOE staff and, and, and the headquarters? That will be managed as part of you know, the wider civil service rules. So um, you would imagine that staff that want to will, will transfer with the function that they work. But the, the group that we've established now is actually going to manage all of that and make sure that in conjunction with trade unions that we make sure that that's all managed and there's a, a seamless process for staff because obviously they'll still be providing the service. You know, that's not going to change. It's just maybe where they provide that service from. Well, Lord Morrow. Speaker, can I ask the Minister, in relation to river pollution, what discussions has she had with Anglin clubs uh, during the year in relation to this particular matter? I haven't had any discussions with Anglin clubs in relation to river pollution over this year, and if the member wants to raise a particular issue with me, I'm happy to receive that representation. Lord Morrow for supplementary. Oh. I'm very disappointed that the uh, minister doesn't think that Anglin's that important, that she should uh, have some discussions with the Anglin clubs in relation to river pollution. I wonder, well, then, could you tell us what discussions she has had with the Department of the Environment or DECAL in relation to river pollution? 
Again, I haven't had any discussions with the DOE Minister. However, officials at that level, both the Rivers Agency and DOE um, officials, engage regularly on all of these issues. And I'm very happy to provide that um, to the member. The member is referring in very general terms to an issue, but again, if he has an issue, he hasn't raised it with me, but I'm very happy to receive that representation. Question number 10 has been withdrawn within the permitted time. As the next period of questions does not begin until 2.45, I suggest the House takes its ease until then.